Heavenly Father, thank you for paying the price that you paid to ransom us. The price of your son's blood, the only currency that you would accept. Our good works mean nothing to you. They, in fact, they are offensive to you. Your son's shed blood, though, in our place at the cross, we have your favor because of what he sacrificed there. And for that, Lord, we worship you and we give thanks to you and we express to you our love for you because of what it has achieved in our hearts and the transformation of life that has come to us, the light that is now illuminating our minds and our hearts where there was once only darkness. Well, Father, we are in great need of you. We are in great need of your Son. And we pray that your Spirit would draw near to us and help us understand your word more clearly because in doing so, we will see you more clearly and we will rejoice and worship you as we understand better who is this God that we serve and love and live under. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's take our Bibles again this morning and open them up to Psalm 23. We are on the slow track through Psalm 23. If there is a fast track, we do not know where it is. And so we will move a few more inches down that track today. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. I'm going to read it to you, these very familiar words, these great words, these incomparable words. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want, David says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. I want to remind you of the two neighboring psalms around Psalm 23. If you look back at Psalm 22, verse 1, you see these familiar words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ uttered those amazing words on the cross as he suffered under the wrath of God for us. So from our vantage point today, Psalm 22 orients us to look to the past ministry and suffering of Jesus. We might say the past cross of Christ is in our view in Psalm 22. If you look forward to Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10, we see these familiar words. Who is the king of glory? Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts. He is the king of glory. A day is coming when Jesus Christ, the King, will indeed get all of the glory that he is worthy of before the nations on the earth. And so from our present day vantage point, Psalm 24 orients us to the future reign of Jesus Christ, or what we might say the future crown of Christ. And sitting between those two psalms is the psalm we're looking at, Psalm 23, and where does it orient us? Where does it point us? Where are we to look? Primarily, we are to look at the present ministry of Jesus Christ. The present ministry. The moment-by-moment -moment ministry of Jesus in our lives, or we might say the present crook of Christ, the good shepherd's crook. His care for us in the moment as our God and shepherd, the good shepherd. David wrote these words. Uh, he wrote what captivated him about Yahweh, what he knew Yahweh to be like to him and for him moment by moment in life. He wrote what he experienced under Yahweh's moment by moment care. David paused himself long enough 
to ask and answer the question, what is Yahweh like and what is it like to live under his excellent care? And so he searched for descriptions and he found them and he wrote them down and we benefit from these meditations from him. Basically, the psalm breaks down into two metaphors. It's one way to look at it. He, Yahweh, is a shepherd with excellent care over his sheep. It's verses one to four. And Yahweh is also, though, a host with um, a hospitality beyond description, willing to honor David, his guest, verses five to six. So David paused long enough to ask himself that question. What is he like? Well, he's like a shepherd. He's, he's like a host. But he also asked, what is it like to live under the salvation care of Yahweh? And then these worshipful declarations are his answer. At the end of verse one, I shall not want, or better translated, I am not lacking anything. The second worshipful declaration is in the middle of verse four. I fear no evil for you are with me. That's what it's like to be under you. I'm not afraid. And the last one is in verse six. I will dwell or I will return to his house all the days of my life because of the way that he hosts me. This is what it's like to live under your, your care. So David slowed himself down long enough to ask and answer and write down for us those meditations on God. What is he like? And what is it like to live under his care? And we've talked about that being the pattern for you, believer, in your worshipful, prayerful pursuit of Jesus Christ when your Bible is open. We must slow down our busy lives enough so that we can open our Bibles and ask and answer the same questions. With my Bible open, what is Jesus Christ like? And with my Bible open, what's it like to live under his salvation care? What's it like to be his disciple? What's it like to live under his lordship? Before we go out and run and engage ourselves busily in, in any gospel ministry, we need to first worshipfully meditate on who Jesus Christ is and what it is like to live under his care for us. Any and all ministry that we could busily engage ourselves in it becomes most effective when it flows out of a full heart that has repeatedly worshipfully meditated on what Jesus is like and how good it is to live under him, under his lordship. We have uh, two ministries in our church which exist to train us in this very practice, uh, to sharpen this very kind of worshipful, prayerful pursuit of Jesus. For the ladies, it's Wellspring, and for the men, it's Build. You still have up until August 18th to sign up for those two ministries. If you have never participated in either one of those ministries, you need to because those two ministries get after the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Those are ministries that train us in how we should go pursue Jesus Christ as Christians. So again this morning from Psalm 23, let's examine these worshipful declarations that David made. He made three I statements, which are worshipful declarations of what's it like to live under the salvation care of God. Two of them fall under the metaphor of Yahweh as shepherd, and one of them, the last one, falls under the metaphor of Yahweh as host, who, a host who is showing David his guest honor and hospitality. Now, we've covered the first declaration. Let's briefly review it. Here it is for you up on the screen. What did David declare? He declared God's abounding provision as his shepherd. And that is based on David's I statement at the end of verse one, I shall not want, or I'm lacking nothing. God's shepherd character, God's shepherd care was so abundant that David could not think of something, anything he lacked under his God and his care. David didn't have a deficit in his life. And that is true for every believer. The New Testament language uh, speaks of it this way, like in 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You are not lacking a thing 
as it pertains to life and godliness. It might not feel like that, but that truth is bigger and it is better than anything you ever feel. And you must cling to it by faith each day, moment by moment. His first declaration was God's abounding provision as his shepherd in verses one to three. Today, let's tackle the second declaration. David declared number two, God's safeguarding presence as his shepherd. That's verse four. And this is based on that I statement in the middle of the verse that says, I fear no evil for you are with me. So let's begin our examination of this verse with where David says he sometimes found himself to be the valley of the shadow of death. Probably some of the most famous words in English anywhere of all time. As we said in our uh, introductory sermon, which is like probably months ago now, that translation of that phrase has led many to view this psalm as the one primarily designed by God for the day when death comes to you, when you're on your deathbed. And this psalm, no doubt, will be a great comfort to you, believer, on that day. But a better translation of that phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, is something actually more general like this, the valley of deep darkness, or the valley of impenetrable gloom, something deep and dark like that. And that better translation then actually broadens the scope of this psalm beyond the deathbed or beyond the funeral scene to any trial, any loss, any pain, any suffering, any persecution, any adversity that is marked by a darkness of the soul, a darkness cast over the mind of the believer. The sense is, it's an experience that is so dark that it's difficult for people to find their way into where you are in that darkness. It's, a, it's an impenetrable gloom you're in, and you can't find easily your way out of it. You feel, in a sense, unreachable there. Listen, a lifetime has only one day of death when it draws near. But a lifetime has perhaps many, many days of deep darkness like this, impenetrable gloom. And so Psalm 23, again, is a psalm of the present, not of the future day only, merely of when that day of death comes. It's for today. It's for today's deep darkness, the moment that you might be in even now. And then the phrase deep darkness, interestingly, occurs in Job about 10 times. Having just gone through that in equipping hour together, if you've been a part of that, there's no surprise to you that at that incredible scene of suffering that Job had, that that phrase would be on his lips, deep darkness. Listen, Job was not on his deathbed. God forbid Satan from taking his life. He was just talking about the, the horrific suffering he was going through, and he, used, he found that phrase, deep darkness, really helpful to describe what he was going through. You can look up Job 3, verse 5, to see how Job used that word there, or that phrase. What is in view in Psalm 23, verse 4, are the moments of life which are severe. They're severe. David's not talking about mildly... Um, difficult circumstances. He's talking about uh, that which makes him feel he is covered in darkness and he cannot see his way out. But notice these really encouraging words in verse four. Even though I walk through valley of deep darkness, walk through. Notice that David did not say, he makes me lie down in deep darkness. That would be that would be unbearable. Now, walking is slow progress, right? It is, uh, if you're in a hurry, walking is not your preferred mode of transportation. But it is slow, but steady. It is slow, but sure progress when we walk. And walking through is always better than being chest to ground in the valley of impenetrable gloom. And it's better than walking around in deep darkness. We're walking through it. 
David says. So be encouraged by what it means to go through the valley of impenetrable gloom. If you go through a tunnel, if you go through a dark forest, if you have to walk through a dark hallway, that means that there's a beginning of it, there's a middle of it, and there's a what? An end. That's what through means. Through. Now, sometimes our good shepherd determines that our exit out of a valley of deep darkness or impenetrable, impenetrable gloom, sometimes he determines the exit is actually death for the believer. Most of the time, many, many other times, an exit exists within this life. And, and that's our good shepherd's prerogative. But regardless, believer, you will never have a deep darkness without an exit with Christ. Paul was in a pretty gloomy place when he wrote to live as Christ and to die as gain. He was in prison. Regardless, you will never have a deep darkness without an exit with Christ. To be in the darkness and to be alive is Christ. And even if you die at the end of it, and that's your exit out, it's gain. You've gone through it. What great news for the believer in Jesus Christ. Valleys of, of deep darkness in life, they have an end, always. And the, the worst for a believer is that you walk through them, through them. You will progress through it slowly but surely, and you will exit someday with your good shepherd, perhaps in this life into a, a season of blessing. And if not, you will exit with him into the next life and enjoy him forever in ways you can't even now. So there David says he is sometimes, even though I, I walk through the valley of deep darkness, steadily progressing through a valley, a, a trial, an adversity, a suffering, a loss of impenetrable gloom. And here is his declaration in that place. Verse four, I fear no evil. And notice what he did not declare. He did not say there, I see no evidence of any evil anywhere. He didn't say that. Evidently, evil hangs out in this impenetrable gloom. It comes near. David knew it was near. But David does not fear the presence of evil. Why? Because there is another presence with him that is more impressive to him. And it is his shepherd, Yahweh. He says, I fear no evil for you are with me. And that's the point at which he changes his pronouns. Before he was talking about he. He guides me, he leads me, he restores me. He makes me lie down. And now it matters even more to him. He's even more personally engaged and caught up in what he is saying. And he says, you are with me. He forgets us. He stops telling us about what he knows Yahweh to be like. And he just turns his direction straight to Yahweh himself and says, you're with me. It mattered to him. You are with me. The good shepherd who leads us, verse 2, the good shepherd who guides us, verse 3, is the good shepherd who walks with us in deep darkness, verse 4, to walk through it. Okay, so how did we get from green pastures? How did we get from waters of a resting place? How did we get um, from paths of righteousness where it's a well-worn, smooth path of sanctification that's going on. How did we get from good places like that to this place? If our good shepherd is the one who's leading us, if he's the one who's guiding us, did he make a wrong turn somewhere? The answer is obviously no. In this life, the green meadows are from him. And in this life, the waters of a resting place are from him. 
and the paths of righteousness and progress and sanctification, those good times of good spiritual growth, those are from him. And the valley of impenetrable gloom is also from him. Do you remember um, how Job cared for his wife when she was at the bottom, when suffering hit him hard? What did he say to her? Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Shall we indeed, if we're going to use the language of Psalm 23, are we only going to accept from him green pastures and waters by a a, a resting place? Are we only going to accept from him the good spiritual growth days and not accept from him the valley of impenetrable gloom? We won't accept that darkness from trials and adversity and loss and pain and suffering. Listen, it might feel like that, that that we're not walking through them. It may feel to you, a lifetime is a long time, but not in comparison to eternity with Christ. It might feel like you're not walking through them, but you're settling down in them. It might feel like that sometimes, but, but this truth that you are walking through it is, is a bigger truth. It's a more reliable truth than your feelings. And you must cling to these truths that contradict your feelings sometimes. It's what it means to be a believer. You don't just believe once and are saved. That's true. You need to keep believing these kinds of promises on a daily basis. It's a key part of your life in Christ. Christian, for a moment, let's just put our our minds on Christ. Think for a moment about your Savior, the Good Shepherd, and ask yourself this about Jesus Christ. Does he know anything about deep darkness and evil being near? What he experienced on the cross is unimaginable compared to any deep darkness with its attending evil that we might face with him in this life. Think about it. For me, he suffered under the impenetrable gloom of the wrath of God on the cross. For you. There on the cross, he overwhelmed by the darkness of that moment. He could see no way out and away from the cross. And his father would not come into the darkness for him because he was bearing away the wrath of God, the sin and guilt and shame of us who believe him. And was evil near him there? Of course so. It was upon him, my evil, your evil, believer. He was the sin bearer there in the deep darkness. He knows firsthand what it is like to be in impenetrable gloom surrounded by evil. But remember this too, even his impenetrable gloom was something he went, what? Through. He went into the impenetrable gloom of the wrath of God on the cross. He went into the deep darkness of the grave and he came out of it three days later in resurrection life. He's the one, according to Hebrews 12, where it is said, who for the joy set before him, listen, the joy was not in the gloom of the cross and the joy was not in the darkness of the grave. The the joy was beyond that. And so he set the joy before him. It was set before him and he endured the cross. He went through it. He endured the grave. He despised the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went through it. And you and I will never go through an impenetrable gloom like that because he did it for us. But that good shepherd, that one, Jesus, that one is with you in your deep darkness, walking with you through it. So what is there to fear? What is there to be afraid of? And the sheep believer David says this is how he knows his shepherd is near or present with him. Look at verse four. 
you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm comforted by you with your rod and your staff. Now, the shepherd's rod was a club that would have been embedded with sharp metal or broken glass designed to beat off the predators. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. We are some urban people, suburban people, and I don't know if when the last time was that you might have had to beat off a bear or a lion because your sheep was, your sheep's leg was in its mouth. If you have a club and that is happening, how close do you have to get to what's going on? I mean, this is hand-to-hand -hand combat. A shepherd was, was a man's man. Think how close the shepherd would have to be to the lion or the bear that had the lamb's leg in its teeth when he would beat the predator off with his rod. He's near, and he is safeguarding his sheep. He's not far away on a hill in camouflage with a sniper's rifle, right? Picking off the wolves. Rather, he's, he's in the scuffle with us. He's in the brawl. He's engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat to defend us, and that comforts us. We have a shepherd near to us, and he, he's armed. And he has a staff. That's the shepherd's crook. That long staff with a curved end on it. If, if the rod is an extension of the shepherd's protection and the shepherd's crook is also an extension of the shepherd's care, he could use it to reach down and hook the lamb who had, which had tumbled off the path and lift that little lamb back up to himself. Or the shepherd could just use it as he walked along and use it to tap, tap, tap the side of the little lamb that was growing weary. I'm right here with you. Don't slow down. Keep walking. How comforting that was. That was a reminder. The shepherd's right here. He's with me. Both his rod and his staff were extensions of his very person. And in our good shepherd, we have a companion who is comforting us. And he's armed. And he loves us. And he's strong. And his presence is more significant than the presence of any evil that would well up in your own heart in the darkness or that would come to you and tempt you. We are safeguarded by him. And David could say and did say, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Christian, what's it like to be a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, one of the many things that we can say is that he is very near to us. He is with us. His presence is greater than all of our sin and any evil that could threaten us or tempt us. In fact, he's even indwelling us. We are in him and he is in us. There is a union with Christ that we learned about in Romans 6 that goes beyond words, that has such um, profound, powerful consequences in our lives for Christian living. And that is true. And he is also just near to us in experience, in his care for us, in his love for us, in his protection of us. He safeguards us through deep, dark trials. And the psalmist experienced this about Yahweh before he ever took on flesh in the sun. Did he not think about these statements here? Go to Psalm 63, verse 7. Look at the way the Old Testament believer would say these kinds of things. This is what David said. Psalm 63, verse 7. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. And the only, the only obvious explanation, if you are in the shadow of the wings of a bird, you're pretty close. You're pretty close. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Look at Psalm 65, verse 4. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house. 
Psalm 73, verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord Yahweh my refuge that I may tell of all your works. You can write down James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Listen, he said that to believers for whom it was true that Christ was indwelling them. So in what sense, if he's already indwelling us, do we draw near to him? How do you draw nearer to the one who's already in you and that you are in? You do it in prayer and worshipful pursuit of him through his word, trusting in him, casting your fears upon him, your anxieties upon him, worshiping him, thanking him. You draw near to him. Matthew 28, 20, what is the great commission? Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them, teach them to observe all that I have commanded, and lo, I am with you. Almost all of the time. Always. Even until the end of the age. He promises his presence for the task of going into the nations for disciple-making. That is what he is after right now. That's why we're still here. He is not with you to fulfill your dreams and your plans. He is with you so that you fulfill his plan to make disciples of the nations. He promises his presence uniquely so to us as we live for him and his purposes. Christian, Your savior is not a drill sergeant on a raised platform barking out orders to you trying to thin the herd of the weak and worthless sheep. He is among us. He is with us. And he's tender towards us. And he is strong for us. Impenetrable gloom may overwhelm us at times and and evil may get really, really close. But he is nearer still, reassuring you through his word that you have nothing to fear. He is there comforting you, chasing your fears away. That's what it's like to live under the good care of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 23, at this point in the end of verse four is where the metaphor concerning Yahweh shifts from Yahweh as shepherd to Yahweh as host, where he's honoring his guest, David. But before we leave the shepherd motif in Psalm 23, I think this morning we need to make the important textual connection with John 10. And so I want you to turn to John 10 and we'll finish our time there. That is where Jesus makes the declaration, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he says twice. John 10. Now listen carefully as you're turning there. All that the Old Testament lays out concerning Yahweh's shepherd character, all that the Old Testament lays out concerning Yahweh's shepherd care over Israel corporately and and as the shepherd over individual believers in the Old Testament, Jesus says in John 10, I'm him. That's me. Jesus put his Nazarene face on Yahweh the shepherd in the Old Testament. In John 10, let's allow Jesus teaching to close out this shepherd theme that we've been examining. And we're gonna just be like stones skipping across the top of the water. We can't begin to cover all of it by any means. And with a similar approach to what we've been doing in Psalm 23 with David's declarations under Yahweh shepherd care, let's close this morning with thinking about what sheep can declare under the good shepherd. What what, what can a believer in Jesus Christ worshipfully declare about what it's like to be under the good shepherd Jesus Christ? First, What can sheep declare? We are known intimately by the only legitimate shepherd. Look at John chapter 10, verse one. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but who climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This is all about who is authorized to be the shepherd 
honored of God's people and who is not authorized. And it is also about the intimacy or the familiarity the sheep and the legitimate shepherd have with one another. Jesus is making the point here that he is the only shepherd authorized to put his face on all that the Old Testament revealed concerning Yahweh's shepherd character and care. And we've only looked at Psalm 23. Yahweh is now here, is what Jesus is saying in this chapter. And he is here in Jesus. The gate has been opened for him to come in. He has come in to his sheep, and he alone is authorized to be the shepherd. He has come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And look how intimately and personally this good shepherd knows his sheep. Look at verse 3. He calls his own sheep by name. By name. It's known in um, this region in, in ancient times that multiple shepherds would put their respective flocks together in the same enclosure and pen, and one shepherd would come and begin to call the names of his sheep. And only his sheep would hear his voice and know it, and they would begin to separate themselves away from the rest in order to follow their own shepherd. That requires intimate knowledge. That requires familiarity with each other, and it requires the shepherd giving each one of them a name. Listen, this morning, if you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, there, you need to know this, there is only one qualified, authorized, legitimate shepherd over the souls of sinners, and it is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is not one of many shepherds over the souls of men who need salvation and help, but he is the only legitimate one, and all the rest are strangers to your soul. They are thieves, and they are robbers of your soul, and this good shepherd will know you personally. He will know you intimately when he saves you, you will not be a number to him. You will have a name and he will know you. Come to him today. Come now. Cast your life upon him. Trust in him and in him alone. He is the only authorized one by God to come and save your soul. What can sheep declare unto the good shepherd? We are known intimately by the only legitimate shepherd. Secondly, what can we declare? We live abundantly through the good shepherd. Look at verse seven. Well, actually, verse six. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them, so he has to go on. Verse seven. So Jesus said to them, truly, I truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. How many are thieves and robbers? Everybody else. The contrast is between Jesus Christ and everybody else. Thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse nine, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Verse 7, 9, uh, Jesus is a door. I, I don't think this is a complete switch of metaphors. Is Jesus a shepherd and then is he something entirely different like a door? I don't think that's what he means. Rather, it is also known that shepherds would often lie down in the gate, in the door of the pen. In a sense, they would bodily become the door, the gate. The sheep could not come in or they could not go out except through the shepherd who has become the door. Anyone who stood before the Jewish people before Jesus, especially the bankrupt uh, religious leadership of Israel in his day, they were never able to bring salvation life to God's people. In fact, all they could do when they came to the sheep is take away from them. And that is exactly what they did. There's only one who could come and be the way, the truth, truth and the life for God's people and it is the good shepherd, Jesus. He restores their souls. All others do eternal damage to souls. Anybody outside of Jesus Christ attempting to 
claim to be able to do something for your soul will only rob, steal, kill, and destroy you. Everyone else acts in self-interest. That's thievery at great expense to your own soul, not Jesus. Only the good shepherd comes to the sheep and they experience not loss, but great gain, abundant life in him, that salvation life in him. Through him alone, we gain it. So believer, what can you declare? The only reason you have eternal life, the only reason you have life abundant, even now, is because you went through Jesus to get it. Thirdly, what can sheep declare? What can a believer declare under Jesus Christ? Number three, we are unified corporately through the good shepherd's sacrifice. Unified corporately. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, you see the contrast again? There's me, and then there's everybody else, or anybody else. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. What is he talking about? The salvation of the Gentiles, on top of the salvation of the Jews that he does save. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Here twice, Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd. Now, when we use the word good in English, it's vanilla right? It's not very descriptive. It's not an adjective you use to dramatically separate whatever it is you're trying to describe away from everything else that you're trying to contrast it with. But that is exactly what Jesus Christ is doing. He is dramatically separating himself away from anybody else, thieves, robbers, hirelings, When we say, it was a good movie. Well, he's a good player. What are we really saying? It wasn't a bad movie. That adjective just doesn't separate off whatever it is we're describing into a category of awesomeness all by itself. But that is exactly what Jesus is doing because there is him and there are thieves, robbers who steal, kill, and destroy. That's not good. There is only one who is good. Why do you call me good? He asked. To test if he really knew what good was. He is the good shepherd. He's not the good shepherd among other good shepherds. He's not saying, I'm not a bad shepherd. This is actually a claim of deity. He's God, he's Yahweh. Yahweh has come. It's an exalted and exclusive claim. He alone is the only good shepherd. He is excellently good with the goodness that is all his own, with a goodness that belongs to nobody else. He is absolutely in a class of goodness by himself as the good shepherd. Again, he is putting his face on all that was said in the Old Testament concerning Yahweh as shepherd over Israel and Yahweh as a shepherd over individual souls he saves. What then is outside of him? Verses 12 and 13, only hired hands who are not authorized, who are not legitimate, who are not owners of God's people. Those who would only ever take from the sheep, never give of themselves. They would never lay down their lives. They see the wolf coming and they run. They act in self-interest at great cost to the sheep. But the good shepherd is not that way. He risks 
everything for the sheep. Everyone else ruins you. Jesus died for you. The good shepherd is in a class of his own. He knows his sheep well, and he is known well by his flock. You remember in verse three, there was this personal knowledge of of individual sheep. He knew them by name, right? Verse 14 is personal knowledge, but of the whole, between the whole and Jesus. Look Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me personal knowledge of the whole. Not only does he know you personally, not only do you know him individually, but he knows us. And we all know him intimately. Like Jesus and the Father are familiar with each other, know each other. We, in the same way, know him and he knows us. And notice this, think about this. If a normal shepherd, a regular shepherd, shepherd died in the defense of his sheep, he really didn't do his sheep any good because now they're dinner or scattered. But not so with the good shepherd who lays down his own life for the sheep. He has an unparalleled goodness about him in his giving up his life for us, that it actually doesn't leave us scattered, but it actually, that's the only way we are united as his flock is when he dies, through his death. And the father loves his son, verse 17, the one who gives up his life. And think about this. We're not unified through his death and somehow we all still remain together and we go on, we find a way to go on together without him because, well, he's still dead. That's not the kind of unity we have. No, he's alive with resurrection life. The authority he had to put his life down, he also had authority to take it up again. We are not sheep without a shepherd. He's alive. What unifies us, when, when, you, when you step into a local church and you see a visible expression, a tangible expression of this great truth, what unites us is something worth worshiping Jesus Christ for. What unites us is not anything in me or you or us There is nothing compelling enough in me. There is nothing significant enough in you. There is nothing important enough in any one of us to draw us all together and keep us together. In fact, just the opposite is actually true. There's plenty repulsive enough in me to make you want a new friend. But the good shepherd unites us together through the laying down of his life and we stand hand in hand and we stand side by side marveling at his intimate knowledge of us and how we all just know him. Listen, we are what we are together, not because some people had a really great idea in 2001 to put a church together. Was it 2001? That's right, April. I had to look at John McCoy. He was the only one I could think of off the top of my head who knew the, the beginning dates. We are what we are together because of him and nothing else and no one else. So then what does it say when one of us forsakes the rest of us? something has really gone wrong in that one's thinking. The eyes of that one have left the good shepherd and have looked at other things that one should not look at. And listen, if this is true about our unity, that what holds us together is his sacrifice, 
If this is true about our unity, you always have a good reason to step toward one another no matter how offended you might be at one another. And his name is Jesus. That's the reason you overcome offense. He put us together by his death. He is the good shepherd who made us his flock in his death for us. Believer, what can you declare under the good shepherd? We are what we are together because of him. Lastly, what can the believer declare under the good shepherd? Number four, we are secured eternally by the good shepherd. We are secured eternally by the good shepherd. Skip over to verse 27. Here's what Jesus says. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Look at verse 27. From the sheep's perspective under the good shepherd, what do we do under his leadership? There's a little sandwich here in verse 27. What do we do? Well, we hear his voice and we hear his voice only in his word. We hear his voice and look at the last part of the verse. We follow him. We hear his word and we follow him in obedience. That's our perspective. And what's in the middle? I know them. Jesus says. The only way we can hear his word and follow him in obedience is because he knows us. We can't hear his voice in his word and we don't follow him if he does not know us as his own sheep. Your hearing his voice in his word and following him depends on him knowing you. And from the good shepherd's side, what's his perspective? Look at verse 28. I give eternal life to them. He gives us indestructible life. It's his very own life he gives us. And the result is that, verse 28, they will never perish. Because that life that's been given to us is imperishable life. And no one else, no hireling, no false messiah, no idol, no rancid religious leadership over the temple like in Jesus' day could snatch away by force any sheep from Jesus' hand. Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I've prayed for you. And Satan could not snatch away a true disciple. He will not let go even though we'd be tugged at violently. So the very life he gives us prevents us from being lost, from being taken out of his hand, but also look at this, the exalted greatness of the good shepherd, his father holds on to us as well. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them violently out of the father's hand. To be in Jesus' hand is to be in the Father's hand. To be in the grasp of Jesus is to be in the grasp of the Father's hand. We who have received eternal life, indestructible life, life that will never perish, we are also in a two fists in one grip. I and the Father are one. That is obviously an ontological statement, a statement of the being of the nature of the Father and the Son, but it's also a statement of their indivisibility on this matter. You're safe. They cannot be divided against one another in regards to your security eternally. Believer, what can you declare under the Good Shepherd? You are safe in His hands. Always will be, eternally so. We'll jump back into Psalm 23, Lord willing, next week, and we will finish up and look at the metaphor of Yahweh as host. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to, as your sheep, Lord Jesus, as your sheep in your hand, 
We want to thank you for this two-fisted grip you have upon us. We want to thank you and marvel at this indestructible, imperishable life that you have given to us. And we want to declare to you how good it is to have it, to have received it from you by faith, how good it is to not have been, to have tried to earn it from you, knowing that we never could. We just want to declare how good it is to have it, to be living with this abundant life under your care. We want you to know how appealing you are to us, how indescribable you are, Lord. Well, we're going to run out of words to try to describe what you are like and what it is like to be under your good care. And Father, I pray for any of your sheep this morning here who perhaps have been wandering a bit, perhaps feel downcast in their souls, discouraged. Perhaps they know themselves to be in a deep, darkest, deep darkness and impenetrable gloom, and they wonder if anyone can reach and find them in that when they themselves cannot see the way out of it. Oh, Father, Lord Jesus, draw near to them. Remind them to consider you again. Give them a tap on the side with your staff. Let them know you are near. Overwhelm them with your presence, your love for them, your power. Take away all of their fears. Draw near to them as they even now, as we now draw near to you. And we ask it in your son's name, amen.